for oh. learning too. Okay, great. So it's, go back and it's recording now. And if anyone, go? yeah, and if anyone um, has an issue with like speaking or something, and then it being recorded, please uh, let us know, and we can edit you out. Perfect. So team, let's get started. So we wanted to take just a few minutes just to share a little bit about who we are. Because we're going to spend four weeks together. Might as well know who the heck these two guys are. We know some of you on the call, but we don't know. I don't know all of you. Uh, so we're going to share just a little bit of our stories. And Paul is going to go first. So do you want to rock and roll, brother? Yes. So uh, I, I'm really honored to be on the phone call. And I am uh, an organizer geek. I like studying uh, organization and community organizing, partly because uh, I really believe uh, it saved my life in a lot of ways. Uh, I come from a very unique family. My dad was a radical priest in the 60s, and my mom was a nun. As many of you know, that's not supposed to happen, that they get together. But they did get together. After being part of the movements of the 60s and the 70s and participating in a lot of protests and community organizing, they left the church, uh, but they kept on being involved in the reform movement in the Catholic Church, and they formed uh, a family. Uh, and with that family, they also brought in um, my grandmother, who they took care of. And uh, this family, uh, my family, we were in Des Moines, Iowa, and it's uh, my two eldest brothers and myself. Can you do the next slide, Carla? I'm here. You do the gotcha. next one? It's on. No, the next one. This is my the family that they put together was very uh, special in a lot of ways in that my dad had uh, sort of a very progressive vision about how to raise us. We had so many different rituals of eating together, going to the YMCA every week, um, celebrating uh, Jewish holidays as well as Christian holidays. We, we sponsored Vietnamese refugees. We went to protest, uh, local protests in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, as part of our social justice Catholic tradition. And we, we had a very tight-knit family, but we didn't really fit into the neighborhood that we belonged in and that we bought a house in. And that created a lot of problems, but we didn't really notice in a lot of ways because uh, we were such a tight family with these countercultural values uh, that were very supportive to me. And then things really changed uh, dramatically for me when I was nine years old. My father died uh, really suddenly. Uh, we did not know it was going to come. He died on Christmas. He dropped dead of a heart attack. Um, it was very hard for my family, and a lot of the structures that made us very tight sort of fell apart. We didn't eat dinner together anymore. We didn't have our family prayer time or going to church, uh, all those routines. Uh, and my mom had to work. And because when my father was around, she was taking care of us, she had to go into the job market and get a very low-wage job. Uh, she was a nurse's aide at a, uh, a nursing home, and she was stressed out a lot uh, with us, uh, trying to provide for us. And... Uh, it was very hard in those years. I think we were all grieving in a lot of ways uh, alone. And uh, we also, uh, not having much money, didn't fit into the neighborhood. So I would get bullied all the time. Uh, I didn't fit in at all in school. I had a lot of depression. But things really changed for two reasons. One, my mom... Uh, one day, I remember, after she got home from work, and she probably had something horrible happen at work, she came home, and she pulled us aside and said, I can't do this alone. Uh, I can't actualize the dream that, you're, that we had with your father to make a special family that held these uh, social justice values, but what I can do is empower you guys to build that alternative in our home. And so she opened up our house to all the misfits in the neighborhood, and she allowed us to experiment. Uh, the second thing that happened that was really unique is my brother became a community organizer, and he was like a father to me and trained me in a lot of community organizing skills. And when I was young, what that meant is I knew how to organize the group of misfits, 
who to bully the bullies. Uh, I, when they made fun of my shoes, I started having a political analysis and a whole group of friends uh, that I really believe saved my life. And so when they made fun of my shoes, I said, screw you and your sweatshop shoes. Uh, and that really protected me from a lot of the bullying, and, and it made me political. I became very political, and still to this day, I really feel that being an activist and being in a community of organizers is really what saved my life. And since then, I've become, a, I was a labor organizer, a community organizer for many years, uh, and, I, and I'll, I'll go into a lot more of my history later, but that's kind of where I come from. Thank you, Paul. So I'll go, I'll go next. So this is a picture of me and my brother and a jar of Nutella. That's something we enjoy to eat a lot. Uh, but we came to the U.S. when I was 12 years old. My young brother was four years old. And for most of our lives here in the U.S., we lived without documentation, without papers uh, in this country. Uh, when I was 16 years old, a few years later, I found out that I couldn't go to college because if they will charge me three times the tuition. They will charge me out-of-state tuition because I was, quote unquote, an international student. So a group of students of us got together. We started forming a campaign, and we did this huge set of mobilizations, and we got to pass a law that will give us in-state tuition rates through the House and the Senate of the Massachusetts legislature. Uh, then I walked, you know, I'm, I'm walking down the aisle of my graduation. I'm feeling super excited. I'm like, oh, my God, undocumented people in, in Massachusetts were about to change the law. i never seen this before. And then three days later, my mother opens the newspaper. And in one side of the newspaper is the face of Mitt Romney. You know, his face is this size. His teeth are about this size. And he's saying how literally Romney is going to veto this legislation, going to kick us out of the state. And he said all this crap about us. And then the other side of this newspaper, to my mother's surprise, is a picture of myself and two friends saying how we're going to beat up Romney and we're going to go get back at him and stuff. And my mom, of course, told me, Carlos, you're going to get deported. At that time, I made him a promise to my brother, which you see in the picture, that by the time he would be 18, so 80 years later, I will figure out how to get him a work permit or some sort of paper so he wouldn't have to go essentially to what I went through. Uh, so that led me to form the Student Immigrant Movement here in Massachusetts, which is a local student organization for undocumented young people. And then uh, the second moment that I shift my life, and I'll end with this, my brother comes into my room when he was 16. And he shows me a letter that he has been invited to go to China. And he probably asked my parents to tell him he couldn't go because of the documentation, but he came and asked me. And he said to me, hey, Carlos, can I go? And to me, it was one of the longest pauses in my life because I really wanted to tell him yes, but the truth was no. There was no way he could do it. So that agitated me. I said, oh, my God, I don't have enough time. I only have maybe three years or something like that. Like I made this promise. I, I cannot win in Massachusetts. So a couple of friends and I started uh, an organization called the United We Dream Network, and I started traveling 20 out of 30 days and became the national coordinator for it, which meant that I did everything from organizing to figure out paperwork and all this stuff. And I was very happy that in 2012 we were able, after so many years of struggle, to win a large uh, direct, well, a, a direct directive by the president that gives a million people work permits, and there's around 800,000 that have already applied. And my brother is one of them, which changed his life. He's in his second year of college. But anything I do, I do it for my family and for the people that I care for. And, and that's why I love the movement. So now we're going to talk, I think, about the two traditions of organizing. And, and Paul's going to lead in this piece about the for his discovery of structure. So um, I was a community organizer in the trenches for many years in the Los Angeles labor movement and also as a student radical. Uh, in college, but my mind was blown when I was able to get out of those cultures and reflect on them. When I was in the cultures, it was hard because there was really only one way to think about it. I was so immersed in it, and everybody around me had the same culture. So um, since then, I've been putting a lot of thought and collecting a lot of literature and collecting thinkers that are talking about different organizing cultures, different organizing traditions. And uh, that we're going to talk about that in a very simplistic term. There's a lot more material that you can look over about that. But for me, I really feel blessed to give that to you because it was so powerful when other people gave it to me, that perspective. And uh, Marshall McLuhan uh, was a famous media critic. And he said this, we don't, 
we don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't the fish. Uh, in that, it's very hard to see what I think most organizers take mm -hmm. for granted in their own tradition. And so, what well, we're not we're not judging people's traditions. We don't want to say they're right or they're wrong. We just want people to take a step back and realize that there are mm -hmm. many different organizing cultures. And there's a context for, for those cultures and why they work, what are the strengths and weaknesses, and what context they work in. Perfect. So I know that we're saying that, so to make this simplistic, and thank you, Paul, for doing that framing right there, is that we're, we're saying in this webinar that there's two dominant traditions of organizing. And uh, we're going to go through each one of them. And then later we're going to go through their differences and more pieces around them. So, uh, Paul, maybe you want to talk about your experience with the hotel workers unions around structure, then I'll talk about mine with IEF. So the first thing, uh, when I was a student organizer, and even my brother started training me when I was very young, uh, and I started doing internships, I, I did an internship at uh, Unite Here Local 11, which was this amazing union that trains massive amounts of organizers for the labor movement. And this tradition, uh, to me, was mind-blowing because it really, it was really a craft, an apprenticeship. It took three years even to call yourself an organizer. Three-fourths of the people didn't make it past the first four months of training. And what it, it, it trained me in is this model that in Los Angeles, this small labor union created this amazing infrastructure of rank and file leaders, of indigenous leaders from the workplace that were housekeepers by day and then, you know, uh, another month went by and they would become these amazing political leaders in the Los Angeles labor movement. These organizers had magical powers, it felt like, to do things I couldn't do as a student organizer and getting in people's doors and having these intense emotional conversations when, when the people were totally afraid to even talk to them. And they were really good about also creating organizational structures that can mobilize people. They can mobilize 800 to 1,200 people every single month for a protest, regardless of the hype or the media attention. And this, to me, uh, was so amazing that I wanted to learn the craft. I didn't just want to be a student organizer. So I went to the Los Angeles Labor Movement, and for six years I, I was trained as a community and labor organizer in that tradition. Uh, and Carlos is going to tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you, Paul. And that was the same tradition that I was brought into. So when I was about 19 years old and I was part of the student immigrant movement, I had a student that I was doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting with. I didn't know it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting until now. Uh, but he, you know, I pulled up my card. I had this Vista print card. So I don't know if any of you had them before that, you know, the youth organizer. And I gave it to him and said, hey, let's talk more. And he said to me, hey, what is this organizer thing? Like, what do you do? And I said, hey, you know, we do protests, we do meetings, we turn people out and stuff like that. And he said to me, hey, but is there like a manual for this? Do you read something for it or did you just make it up? And I said, no, 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 no. We just make it up as we go. And I left the conversation kind of curious because nobody had ever given me a manual. I was just kind of like winging it, you know, from what I was seeing and reading some stuff but not really knowing what the heck I was doing. So I went to the public library. There was no Google back then yet. And I asked for books on organizing. And they, after going through like 20 books about how do you clean up your closet or how do you organize your living room, whatever, I found this book by called Rules for Radicals by Solonis Kusachmati, and a lot of you have heard of. So then I went into a process for many years to learn the craft of organizing through Saul's work. So I went and spent some time with the Industrial Era Foundation, or IEF, which is a group that Solalinsky founded to extend his craft across the U.S. And there's many organizations all across the country that use that tradition. Uh, but when we mean this tradition of structure organizing, we mean, I think, a couple of things. But we're going to just talk about a couple ones. The first one is mean it's really about relational work. It's about one-on-one -on -one meetings where you're really trying to look in the neighborhood or in the city. Who are the right people that have a leadership attitude, that they could become leaders, even if they do not believe they're leaders themselves? And then you're still also looking for people that have a following. Well, does these people have a following? And actually, most of the descriptions of leadership in, in structure ways is that leaders have followers. And if you don't have a follower, you're not a leader. Again, I'm just making this you know, overly simplified here for the sake of our learning. The second element of the structure piece is about really deep leadership development. 
And I know we had the picture of Ella Baker there before in the structured tradition, but she is one of the persons that embodies this tradition as well, which is about, I don't know, she heard her quote, which is, give people a light and they will follow, or a strong people do not need strong leaders. I mean, all of her quotes were about really develop indigenous leadership, mainly across America, but a lot through the South and the civil rights movement. And the last element of structure that we want to say is really about how do you can, as Paul was saying, how can you turn out the same amount of people every time you want, every three months or every month? How can you turn out the same thousand people, 2,000 people, regardless if the issue is hot or not? So most of these organizations, uh, some of the leading groups on this are like the PICO National Network or Midwest Academy does a lot of training on this or the New Organizing Institute does a lot of learning on this, right? Uh, in PICO or in IAF or in the DART Network in Florida, which it's another kind of structure-based identity network, they can turn out the same 3,000 people every six months, regardless of what happens, you know? And usually the way they do is they turn 3,000 people to a church out of institution and leaders. And they go and see who's the guy that can give us what we want, and we beat the crap out of a politician. We ask him, hey, are you supportive of us? If he says or she says no, we boo them and say yes, we clap them, and that's how we hold them accountable. So it's very institutionalized. So that is the structure tradition. And uh, I wanted Paul to talk a bit about how he came, because we were both structure organizers. And I know that Paul came to actually seeing how the other – tradition happens, so the momentum tradition. You want to go, Paul? So at the time, I was, I was still uh, being apprenticed as an organizer and learning the science of structure-based organizing in the labor movement. But I went back to school to graduate, and when I went back to school, uh, what Seattle happened. Uh, we were participating in a lot of things that were getting a little bit of momentum, but uh, Seattle in 99, the, the world, the the protest to shut down the World Trade Organization. We actually call the movement the Global Justice Movement, but most people call it the Anti-Globalization Movement. Really captured the front page of the New York Times and almost every single media outlet for a whole week. They shut down the World Trade Organization and the negotiations around these trade agreements that were incredibly oppressive to um, anything from turtles to the Teamsters to indigenous people in southern Mexico, uh, all of those trade agreements at that moment shut down. And then uh, it, it shut down because tens of thousands of people were protesting in the streets and thousands of people were risking arrest, actually creating a barricade. And I hate to say I wasn't there. I was actually getting arrested at the School of Americas, which was another mass protest, but it wasn't getting momentum. Uh, it wasn't getting much momentum at all. But this thing got so much momentum that when I was at Hampshire College and we were planning the next meeting right after Seattle, uh, we, we, we talked to maybe a handful of people about showing up to the meeting, and literally 150 people showed up to the first meeting. And this blew my mind. Uh, all the science of how I mobilize people to meetings and who shows up through structures and relationships didn't apply anymore. And every meeting we had, lots of people showed up, and we temporarily we could do things that were unimaginable, not really through structure or relationships, because there was so much activity, so many people were turned on by the movement and the media and the momentum that all my rules, and it was very hard for me, to, it was very disorienting for me, that I had, uh, I had all these rules and the craft of structure-based organizing kind of got thrown out of the, the, the door. Um, and I learned this whole new tradition, uh, which, I, I mean, I, I mentored and, and learned from, from a lot of leaders in, in this tradition, which we call the momentum tradition. Um, and it really... In the United States of America, most of the big outbursts of mass protest and mass civil disobedience uh, has come from this model that was really developed uh, in 19, the late 1970s and 1978, which is in what's called the clamshell alliance that shut down a nuclear power plant. And then that model spread and has been adopted by ACT UP. It's been adopted by even uh, the anti-globalization movement. It was adopted by Occupy. And this model really uses consensus-based organizing. It really creates lots of very loose structures to create huge actions. 
uh, and it hypes these actions mm -hmm. and uses the momentum to create it that through militant or we call escalating nonviolent action. And there's a lot of thinkers about how that happens, how to uh, create these mass scale actions. Uh, Lisa Fithian, uh, George Lakey, we put on the slide, training for change is really good about thinking about a lot of how those, some of those structures, how you create some of these mass actions and, and the structures that we use. And I think um, a lot of people in the United States don't realize it, but a lot of the DNA of, the, of that tradition was developed in the clamshell lines and it has evolved from that. But a lot of the things that we take for granted, even uh, the mic check we've, has been used multiple times in that tradition, things like consensus decision making, um, large sort of front-loaded actions that then you create a, 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 a mass meetings where people do consensus decision making in spokes councils, affinity groups, all those things have really been developed from that model. Thank you, Paul. And maybe, Paul, you want to talk about the moments of the whirlwind? Now we want to, I think, now the last section before we do a little break is we want to talk about uh, what has been the experiences that we have seen through movements of momentum and both of structure? So Paul and I are going to talk a little bit about that. So Paul, do you want to talk about the moments of the world? When so the global justice movement sort of swept me up, and I realized that what happened is the momentum energized all these people across the country, and even people on my <laughs> own campus were all of a sudden interested in a way that I could have never done through individual relationships or structure. And a lot of that create so much activity, so many different places with so many people wanting to participate that we had to, well, we had to manage this sort of world winner activity and it's very hard to figure out everything that was happening and how to create structures for it. And I had to rethink, partly through this tradition of momentum, how to organize in that moment of the world win. And uh, that term came when we were doing research about moments of the world win and Saul Alinsky, uh, who codified the structure tradition, Von Hoffman was organizing in Chicago, a black community in Chicago, when the civil rights movement hit. And the Freedom Rides happened, which was a moment of the world when that was created in the South around desegregating the interstate bus travel. And it got major publicity. And all of a sudden, all of the rules of his organizing, he was planning a, a, the first sort of mass meeting in, the, in, in a church where they were going to have a Freedom Rider speak. And he was going through his structures, and all of a sudden, the church was packed. Three times more people showed up than he ever expected through his sort of craft and science. And, and he went back to Alinsky, and he said, we, I don't know what's happening here, but we have to rethink everything we do right now, because we're organizing in the moment of the world. That's what he called it, the moment of the world. So let's think about how to do that. And Alinsky actually had a really interesting innovation uh, with two in Chicago, which is a community organization in Chicago, and in Rochester fight, he tried to do some integration because he was rethinking how he was organizing because of this moment of the world win. But these moments of the world win aren't unique to Occupy. It's not unique to the global justice movement. The civil rights movement was a series of these moments of the world win, whether it was um, the student, the lunch counter sit in the 1960s or whether or not it was the Birmingham campaign or the Selma campaign, the March on Washington, Selma, all these, if you read the accounts, people felt they were in that same moment of the world when and organizers throughout history have had this dichotomy of not knowing what to do when they were trained in the structured tradition. But it wasn't just the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was really unique because there was a whole bunch of moments of the world when that the movement actually created. Uh, and could create, but we see it even in, in our times. Uh, in, 19, in 2003, the anti-war movement had an incredible outbreak of protests right before the Iraq War, which the New York Times called one of the largest protests in, in world history, synchronized protests in the world history. All over the world, there was uh, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people marching, uh, and, and the New York Times said it was, it was one of the first times where world leaders felt the pressure from below of public opinion. Uh, we also felt this moment of the world when, uh, not just in the anti-global, in but in the immigrant rights marches. For me, being in the labor movement, it blew me away. Even though we were part of it, uh, it really transcended all of our structures 
uh, that we were going through. Carl is going to talk a little bit about that moment of the world. But yes, thank you, Paul, because I love that we're getting into these moments of discovery of momentum. Because I remember I was probably two or three years after I had graduated high school. And we had, in Boston, the way it manifests, we had the small marches, like there was 200 people, then 500 people, then people in Chicago exploded in March 10, and there was like, I don't know, like 10,000 people in Chicago, and then of course Los Angeles had come out with like 200,000 people on like April 10, and then suddenly we were just doing marches every week, and there was like gazillions of people, I mean, in, I never, they think were the largest demonstrations in Boston, at least here. But the whole thing was humongous everywhere. I mean, you know, people did manifestations in Colorado, in Wisconsin, it was humongous. I mean, it's still pretty big in Wisconsin every year, in every May 1st. Uh, but just the amount of momentum that we had, and to me, that was a humongous discovery. But actually, I didn't have the level of thinking that Paul had at that time, because I actually got depressed in 2007, after the marches, because the next year, we couldn't move not even like 2% of the people that came out last year. And I was like, what the heck? This doesn't work out. This was just like a flash in the pan stuff. And I believe all the Alinsky stuff was just like, oh, you know, movements just come and go. We got to build organizations. I was thinking like that was a waste of time. We didn't pass legislation, <laughs> you know. Uh, but we had this huge incredible amount of power, and it really changed the movement. It really changed the way people look at themselves and the people that got engaged because all those people that marched voted differently in that 2006 election where the Democrats took back the House. So that was a little bit of this moment of the whirlwind. And I know Paul's going to talk and end with Occupy. Well, I just want to say that uh, in, in the, the anti-globalization movement and in the immigrant rights movement in the Occupy, uh, me – I'm being situated in the labor movement and having a lot of relationships in the labor movement, in the immigrant rights movement, these conversations were exploding about how do we respond to this, to this momentum. And there was a real divide between the people who were sort of organizing the momentum stuff and the structure stuff. But when, when the, the momentum died down, the structure were the only people that could really mobilize. And there, right. That created a lot of tension, and also it created this incredible depression for me because you know, I would fight with my eldest brother who, was, who never really liked to participate in Momentum because he was more of an IAF guy. He was more a structure-based guy. He was like, oh, well, we can you try to use their Momentum, but it's just a flash in the pan. It doesn't matter. So, um, but one thing that happened from, from Occupy especially is that people – we were winning battles in the labor movement. We were winning. We had a campaign to organize housekeepers in Santa Monica, and uh, they were getting paid like eight bucks an hour, and now they get paid 14 bucks an hour with health benefits. Like we were able to win real battles that would affect tens of thousands of workers. We were able to pass living wage measures and everything, but we were losing the war. Workers all over the country are getting paid less in our industry, and. Also, the onslaught of the economic inequality that ha happened because of the corruption of the political system is getting worse and worse and worse. So we're winning battles and losing the war, and it's really depressing for the structure. But the momentum people feel exactly the opposite. We can create all these men momentum moments, these moments of the world, win, but how do we keep the moments alive? And we, it really sucks to be part of a movement that you feel like dies. Uh, so what happened after Occupy is there was a real moment where a lot of people started having this conversation of how do we use momentum, how do we combine structure and momentum, how do we keep the momentum going, and talking a little bit about these two structures. So I had been studying about this stuff. Uh, I, I've been writing a book with my, my brother Mark, who's an academic, uh, Mark Engler, and we were writing a book for the nation about momentum and structure. But all of a sudden there was this new audience of people who were kind of depressed of losing momentum. And it's not just with Occupy. I think probably a lot of people who have been part of Moments of the Whirlwind have experienced that depression when the momentum dies down yes. and the structures aren't there to absorb them. So we, we all of a sudden uh, were getting our material out, and everybody was reading it now, and, and a lot more people were interested in, in these two traditions and how to integrate them. So, Carlos, you want to take the slide? Yes, I think, thank you so much for that, Paul. And I think on this slide, so I, again, we're reviewing, right? We have the momentum tradition that Paul explained and then the structure tradition. But we know that it's, 
we're just putting them here as polarities, but we know that some traditions or some organizing drives have had a little bit of both, and some of them have integrated each other more than others. So that's why we put the clamshell lines a little bit more in the up in the in the in the polar opposite of momentum and industrial areas foundations and these key organizations more closer to the structure tradition. But there were multiple people, even like Gandhi, really a person that really tried to integrate both, or Martin Luther King, a person that really understood momentum, but really also tried to integrate some structure. So we'll come back to this spectrum, but we just put it here uh, because it's not black and white. It's actually much more gradual that we can think of. So team, let's take a deep breath for a second. I know we've been in the skull for some time now, but we wanted to actually come back and ask you about your experience. So the first question that we have is, have you ever experienced a moment of the whirlwind, uh, either with your organizing or in your experience? And two, have you organized as part of a structure-based organization? Either of those two. And then what worked well in your experience and what was limiting? We wanted to hear a little bit from you because we're not in a regular webinar. We're in a movement webinar, so we always want to hear with you. We want to see how you're feeling about stuff. So we'll take a couple. Uh, we maybe take four or five of those comments or those reflections. Uh, so, Belle, can you help us with that, too? Great, yeah. So um, we want to encourage you all to think about these questions and answer them. Um, and you can take some notes for yourself because I'm sure um, most of us have, have probably had uh, contact with one or two of these traditions. But um, for the sake of time, we're going to take um, about f four to five comments. So we'll give you all um, about a minute a minute or two to, to, to take your notes. And then if you would like to discuss with the group, please just go submit a question and I'll, I'll take the questions in the order that they come in. So I see Curtis has one. So we'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes and then we'll start uh, sharing with each other. And another thing I want to mention, I apologize, but uh, Kurt, I didn't, we didn't get a chance to introduce you. So if you want to do that really quickly, you can. And I also skipped Kate, but it looks like she jumped off of the call. So Kurt, you're unmuted now if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kurt, and I organize for 99 Rise in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm just hoping to get a more comprehensive understanding of this integra integrated model since this 99 Rise is very much uh, yeah, modeled after the idea that we can integrate these effectively. So I'm looking to get a more thorough understanding. OK, cool. Thank you, Kurt. And then Guido just let me know that Kate is listening from where he is. So I can go ahead and unmute Guido, and Kate can introduce herself. Go ahead, Kate. Hey, this is Kate uh, Aronoff calling in from the Student Divestment Network as well as Work for Mountain Justice. Um, and I've been excited to hear a little bit about momentum and uh, I found it really resonant in thinking about fossil fuel divestment. Um, and I'm looking to learn more and especially around the integration piece and thinking about how to bring structure into that movement. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. And again, I apologize, uh, Kate and Kurt, for skipping you earlier on. Perfect. So, team, any reflections, any sharing you want to do? Please don't be shy. Don't be shy. Nobody's going to yes. bite you. Yeah, we, we have one volunteer. It's just Curtis for now. But um, please, we want to encourage you to, to share. And even if it's just, you know, really unfiltered thoughts that you have, initial impressions, that's totally fine. We don't expect you to have, like, a thesis prepared for us. <laughs> Okay, so Curtis, if you're ready, um, we can start with you, and then maybe once you start talking, people people will feel less shy. Okay. Curtis, you have the floor. Hey. Cool, cool. Um, so, you know, in my experience, not with just Dream Defenders, but kind of uh, uh, every organizing job or, or opportunity or experience I've had has been within structure based organizing. Mm. However, I think with Dream Defenders, uh, we've had moments of the whirlwind, right? Um, where there's been momentum that we've been able to, polarization that we've been able to throw ourselves into. The first being the initial march to Sanford, Florida, where we blocked the doors when Zimmerman still hadn't been arrested. I wasn't as directly involved in the organizing of that. I was more so the kind of follow-up, right, after the Zimmerman, Zimmerman verdict, 
when we took over Florida's uh, state capital. So when thinking about organizing in that climate, I think what worked well was uh, uh, the tactic itself um, and putting forward a set of demands that were somewhat that were surrounding the culture of the case, right? I think that provided an opportunity for folks who were looking for uh, something beyond just kind of the marches that weren't tied to concrete demand. It was an outlet for people to get engaged. However, I think there was a struggle for us, and you know, even still, we, we still function off of a lot of the structure based organizing from you know the Linsky tradition and everything else. So it was like, how do we? Like from that momentum, the folks who were able to come to the capital, we then went through a process of like developing them as leaders and et cetera, all of that traditional kind of way we're taught, right? But I think there was a real issue of like it could have been bigger, right? What was the replicable tactic that we could have harnessed at that moment mm, that mm. people who couldn't directly be at the capital could have participated in? So it was a moment where the folks who came in were able to, you know, uh, physically bring them into the organization. But I think it was a moment where we could have tried to, you know, make it go beyond just Tallahassee and Florida State Capitol. So that's one of the things I'm really excited about learning more about the momentum model. I've read a little bit about Opor, but like how, how can we create replicable tactics, right? And that sort of open source organizing model so that when we have these moments of polarization and the momentum, it's not just based on kind of geographic location, but that we can create a moment of crisis across the country. Awesome. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you so much, Curtis. That's that was great. Good. So next, um, Leyland. Am I saying your name right? Is it Leyland or Leland? Oh, wait, let me actually unmute him. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, now you're on. Hi, cool, thanks. Yeah, Leland is, is, is how my name is pronounced. Got it. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, um, in 2012, I was part of a Minnesota campaign. Um, Neo-Christians put a um, uh, constitutional amendment on the Minnesota ballot to make same-sex marriage unconstitutional. Um, and I was part, I was kind of on the periphery, but I was part of one of the biggest campaigns that Minnesota has ever had. Um, they, they slash we um, uh, got record num numbers of people involved knocking on doors. One thing that I would think was particularly good was that it was a referendum, so every single person who you reached and, and mm. managed to change their mind, you had an impact. It was very tangible for people what they could do. Um, and the focus was really on reaching out to people with conversations about love and commitment um, rather than rights, because they found that when they talked about rights, like hospital visitation rights, it gave people the impression that gays were greedy, um, and that actually basic topics like love and commitment really moved people. Um, and at one point, I wrote, a, I, read an, I wrote an open letter to an anti-marriage activist um, on my personal Facebook page that got 400 shares, um, which I think was kind of indicative of how much energy there was in the state. Like it was an incredibly positive, um, an incredibly positive, popular, um, popular movement in the state. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was interesting. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, does anybody else have uh, comments? And it doesn't, again, I just, I really want to encourage you all to participate because I think that's how we learn better. And also um, we have a wonderful group of people here and I'm excited to hear about your experiences. So I'm gonna wait. Um, yay, Sasha, okay, great. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I was talking to myself. My bad. Uh, so I, um, I'm with Get Equal. Uh, we started our chapter, um, and we have about a dozen other uh, state chapters. And when we started off um, really uh, organizing here in, in 2011, um, we were. It was right around when Occupy started, so we were able to. Uh, kind of do a lot of intersectionality along that, um, like with the Queer and Trans Caucus there. And I um, feel that there was a lot of energy there, but then when it came back 
to working in the structure-based um, organization that we had with uh, Get Equal, um, that it, it didn't carry over and it feels very siloed here in mm. Massachusetts, especially after um, marriage equality got passed here and around LGBTQ issues and, and really getting people engaged. So geographically, that's really made a difference. Um, but one thing that we were able to do because we had over those dozen chapters was uh, solidarity actions, um, which were really helpful, especially given how different state to state the rights are for LGBTQ people. So I think that um, having the structure, especially the multiple chapters, was really helpful from that local to national uh, idea. But again, tapping into that energy is just mm -hmm. really challenging here in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> That's real. Yeah. So let's get into the second part then, Belle. And Wait, we have one more. Oh, one more, one more. One more. So Kate. Kate, and then that's that's our last one. Kate, go. Everyone. Um, so, yeah. So last year on Swarthmore's campus, there was this uh, period of sort of incredible momentum um, where there, my group, Swarthmore Mountain Justice, had been organizing towards an uh, open board meeting that we had requested around divestment. Um, but over the course of their semester, of the semester, there had been um, just a series. So, of controversies and, and ongoing sort of organizing that had happened and, and just events that really um, really were getting getting people excited. So um, one was a, a really active Title IX campaign um, to get the school to rethink the way it related to sexual assault. It was getting a lot of national media attention. Um, another was that over the course of the semester, um, there had been people had uh, peed on the door of the Intercultural Center four times in a row. Um, so the weekend before the board meeting, um, in kind of the midst of all this, um, somebody went and peed on the, that door um, again, and sort of within 24 hours, there were there was a, a rally outside of the president's office. Um, there was a, a rally outside of the dining hall, um, and more people than, than sort of ever come together um, were organizing protests, sort of um, around the clock. Um, so as we as we went into the this open board meeting, we had already decided that divestment really wasn't what was um, what was exciting people on campus, um, and it made this plan to to bring a lot of people in with us and, and make it kind of a space for um, folks to air uh, air various grievances they they have with the administration and the board who are on campus pretty pretty infrequently, um, and just in the planning process uh, towards that, a lot of a lot of folks coming together who really had never worked together before. Um, who were all sort of generally on the student left at Swarthmore, but really never um, had come together, made decisions uh, with each other. Um, and this really incredible um, and almost instantaneous moment of, of coalition. Um, and at that, that moment when the, in, when the board meeting happened, about 200 people kind of entered the room um, and just created this incredible sense of, of really shifting power dynamics with the board and there was all this talk afterwards about well what can this become is this going to be a student union is this going to be um, you know the, the start of something much bigger the start of something that's really um, changes the way that, that student student power looks on campus um, and these conversations really really last a long time um, and there were a, a series of teach-ins um, which have been the result of, of a mostly consensus-based decision decision-making process, and sort of as as finals rolled around, this was at the end of the semester, um, the energy sort of dwindled, and then coming back in the fall, there was there was still excitement, but um, really uh, energy around around this this moment of excitement kind of died down, um, and we were left with just a lot of questions around well, what could that have been? Um, where were were there opportunities lost? Um, were there um, places where we could have built structure where there was none, um, and it, it just really became this 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 open question. It's still still very open in a lot of ways around, um, you know, what was it that was around at the time, um, which which either could have resulted in, in something some kind of longer term um, yeah. organizational model or um, yeah, just what what all was involved in that in that moment. Cool. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Okay, so that's the end. Uh -huh. That's the, the last of our participant shares, and we're going to resume. Let's move on.
This is great. Sorry, as all of you speaking, I'm having all my memories back <laughs> of that into a structure after a lot of momentum. Uh, yeah, that was intense. So the <laughs> second part of this one, I'll choose just two, two more, will be what are the difference among these two different traditions or these two dominant traditions? So Paul and I are going to go through five of them. I imagine there's more. We know there's more, but we just wanted to make it simplify. So the first one is a theory of change. So pretty much what is the theory of power between these two traditions? I'm going to do the structure, Paul's going to do momentum through all these distinctions. So in the structure concept, really the theory is that you have leverage through target for a measurable change. So you have to figure out between my group, my organization, my team, what do we have of leverage with that specific target, either being a mayor or being a state local representative or being uh, a local corporation or corporation has a headquarters in X, Y, and C place, and what is our relationship, and how do we target them through our power, which could be a lot of disruption, but just mainly sometimes electoral uh, threats. So one example of that, for example, oh, did I say example? An example to maintain. Okay, is the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, which is an IF organization here in Boston, and most of the times the actions that they do are never really rallies. It's usually you bring as many people as you can, either 50, 100, 200, 300, 1,000, and you put the politician that you want to get the yes or no commitment from in the middle of the room, as I said before, if he says or she says no, you boo the crap out of them, you boo them, uh, but if he says yes, you clap them around, and that creates some sort of different level and commitment, so that's the moment they're trying to sit in. They've been doing the same kind of actions for the last, I don't know, 50 years, 40 years now? It's insane. I mean, it's just, they perfected it to the, to the core. Uh, and I will just end with this uh, quote before Paul talks about the theory of change of momentum. But at least he said it this pretty clearly. Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. It's pretty clearly that the theory of, of power that Elinsky had and, and most of the structure tradition is based on is that you build mass organization, and then mass organization confronts one target or a set of targets, and you pressure them as much until they break and give you what you want. And now Paul's going to talk about the theory of change in momentum. So there is a big difference that happens a lot of times in movements. You have conflicts between these two dominant traditions throughout the civil rights movement and many movements. And if we understand the differences, we can really figure out how to integrate. So right now we're really going to talk about what are the prime, how these differences create conflict. What are the distinctions between them? And the biggest one is the whole theory of how you win. <laughs> and in the momentum tradition, you're really focusing on building popular active support, uh, active popular support. And you do that by polarizing issues, by getting everybody to move towards your side, move towards the movement. Uh, and so that really, uh, Unlike the structured tradition, which is like laser focused, you, you have a, only a specific tradition, you have a specific structure, and with a funneling the energy in this laser focused way. In movement organizing, you're really trying to do things to move the population, and that's a different orientation. You feel like movements have the power to do that, and in, in almost all these different movements, um, many academics, have different models of talking about how movements through U.S. history especially have polarized uh, the public when they started, like the women's suffrage movement, for instance, they didn't have that much support. It was actually a very unpopular issue. And the people who were against women's suffrage had lots of power and also they had a lot of support among the public. And that's where a lot of movements start. Well, it got to a point after decades of doing symbolic actions, doing, uh, having different moments of the world win, where they polarized the public so they had a lot of active allies and the movement had grown and the opposition had less and less active support and they had mostly neutral. And you get to that point, almost always you win. It's not incremental reforms. These are big changes that happen through public opinion that aren't happening through little tiny leverage, although that sometimes works with this dynamic, but what it's really happening is you change the weather. In structure, they're trying to feel what the weather is and then use whatever weather they have uh, to create 
really strategic strikes. And this movement, they changed the whole weather in a couple of decades so that the whole American public supported it in the end. So after, nowadays, it's unthinkable if a politician would say, I don't believe in the women's right to vote. That politician would not be able to get elected. Even if they said that, they would not be able to get elected because a majority, a super majority of the American public really believes in women's rights to vote. There is probably still a few people, maybe in the right wing religious circles, that don't believe in the women's right to vote, but they really are marginalized um, and, and can't, don't really have power because almost all the institutions of power depend on the active public support of the, these active allies. Next slide. Rock and roll, Paul. So uh, uh, Erica Chenoweth, uh, a great researcher in civil resistance, she talks about this in all these struggles ac across the globe. And she talks about active public support as this critical thing that topples dictators. Um, they talk about it as the pillars of support. If you get enough active support, the people withdraw their obedience from all the institutions. Uh, and when she did this study, according to the, the data set of 300 nonviolent and violent campaigns worldwide from 1900 to 2006, none of the cases failed after achieving the active and sustained participation of just 3.5% of the population. And some of them succeeded with far less than that. Of course, 3.5% is nothing to sneeze at. In the United States of America today, that constitutes over 11 million people. So in this theory of change, if you can polarize the American public so you have a passive support from a supermajority and then you have active support from 11 million, meaning that those people are willing to march, they're willing to participate, they're willing to withdraw their support from the institutions, almost always you will win. And, and, and Erica Chenoweth sort of talks about that that's a common denominator in all these movements that she studied. Thank you, Bob. So the second distinction we're trying to make is that what does victory look like for either of these two traditions? Uh, I think in the structured tradition, uh, what victory looks like is when you have enough power that most of the times you can influence either local or statewide politics in the structured tradition. I actually, in the national context of structure, there are some coalitions that have tried to put national politics like on immigrant rights or on housing and some of them have been able to. Uh, but mainly means to have real power with the current power structure. That's what victory looks like for this too. And, but actually, what the other part that I wanted to add before Paul talks about momentum is that in the structured tradition, actually, it starts very small. It doesn't start very large. Like, you don't try to engage the whole public. I think the first actions that you do is you either try to figure out, well, what is the local issue in this neighborhood, in this street, or in this community that is really going to develop leadership? Because actually the assumption is that you need way more power to confront the power structure. So you wouldn't want to go to the public without having mass organization first. Uh, so sometimes it means you have to fix kind of the light post or you have to figure out trash issues or fix it in a pothole. You got to do whatever it takes so that our local leader in the neighborhood can say like, yes, I beat up the, you know, the local city council. I got my light post built. Now I can get my neighbors involved. We can form organization and eventually grow enough power in which we can win large your issues. But it's a different dynamic because you start very small, very laser focused, right? The momentum, you start very big from scratch. Uh, so Paul, do you want to talk about what victory looks like in the momentum tradition? So Francis Fox Pippin, who's a, a really famous sociologist and movement historian, uh, she talks about the distinction between structure and momentum a lot. And when she studied American history, she said most of the egalitarian reforms in American history did not come from gradual incremental reforms. Periods of egalitarian reforms come in rare intervals, or what she calls moments of reform generated by disruptive protest movements. She was saying momentum changes the entire weather and opens right. up this window for lots of changes to happen. And when that happens, partly through moments of the whirlwind, Lots of changes happen without even the, the structured campaigns. And my example of this a lot of times is like with, in our time, marriage equality. Uh, 
right when, if you were following the polls, there was this critical shift of public opinion that happened. It was a linear growth of getting more and more public support around same-sex marriage, supporting that, and then all of a sudden it got a critical mass, and then guess what? Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton changed their mind. They had a deep moral conversion to support same-sex <laughs> marriage at the federal level. Obama changed his mind. He said, I thought about it. it just, it's because the, it became politically expedient. It became viable that they could support that issue and actually get more support as a politician, not less. The weather had changed, and then every, everywhere it was changing without even the incremental changes because the weather had changed. And that was through a gradual process of the movement fighting. And the same thing happened in a lot in the immigrant rights movement around the DREAM Act. But that happened in all these movements. They hit a critical mass, and then everything changed. Uh, another academic, uh, Tom Hayden, said, you know, uh, change is slow until it's not. <laughs> so you're winning these incremental changes, and all of a sudden, if you can create a moment in the world and really create a huge shift in public opinion, all of a sudden you, you, you hit a breakthrough and everything changes. And that happens in dictatorship too, is that they organize, and when they get a critical mass to pull the pillars of support of the obedience and the participation in the dictator regime, the whole thing topples. Um, but it looks very different than what we see as incremental reforms. Thank you, Paul. Third distinction is the difference between campaign demands and tactics between these two traditions. So I'll talk about the structure piece and actually the momentum maybe a little bit as well. So in the structure side, it's really about winning transactional concessions and winning incremental reforms that we said. And that's how you want to frame your campaigns to build more power. You want to figure out your demands around that. But the interesting thing, and actually I'll give an example that, I, sorry Paul, I didn't rehearse this one, but in most of the states, we were talk, we talked about uh, getting in-state tuition for undocumented students. And we noticed that a lot of us said that, but most of the public did not understand what the heck we were talking about, even though that was our demand. And when we won public opinion of the DREAM Act, and then people started framing it around local state DREAM Acts, Suddenly, they all got massive momentum and massive public support because actually the public understood what that meant. So that's, for example, a difference between instrumental demand, which is the in-state tuition piece, and a symbolic demand, which is like, what's the Massachusetts Dream Act? Like, it makes no sense legislatively. What is it? What is in it? It doesn't matter. The whole question is for the public to recognize. So that's maybe a little different from that tradition. One more piece that I would add here is that actually... If you're an immigrant, if you're one of the 11 million people in this country without status, many people are actually able to adjust status, either through a family petition or other ways. But the problem is that because many people came through the border, if you get out of the country, you will get a 3 to 10 year bar. That's a lot. That if you get out of the country, you cannot come back for 3 to 10 years. Uh, so, for example, if we would just change the 3 to 10 year bar instrumentally, right, structurally, we would change it, it would be dramatic. Three to four million people will be able to get legalized. It will be amazing. But the problem is that nobody in the freaking world understands what the heck the 10-year bar is. And by the time we inform the whole public about what the 10-year bar is, we we'll probably won't have much people here. So that's how we – and the symbolic nature of momentum, and maybe it will be great, Paul, if you can talk about the example of how uh, Gandhi uses as a symbolic demand through the Salt March. So – Gandhi was uh, a huge leader in, India, in India's independence movement and in the political party of the Indian National Congress. And he chose to mount this huge campaign to overthrow the, the British colonial system. Uh, he chose to base the campaign around the salt tax. Now, nowadays we think, oh, well, that, that makes sense. But a lot of people in the Indian National Congress thought it was crazy. Because the salt tax was such a small, symbolic thing. Uh, it didn't even really generate much revenue for the British government. It wasn't going to create real uh, economic disruptive power for the British. The reason he picked it is because it had great symbolic resonance with the public. Um, and it was something also symbolic in that everybody needed it. And everybody felt a little bit of the impact of the salt tax tax, even the, the poor, the poorest to the richest people, and it was almost like ATM fees. But if you can imagine, if you were the Indian National Congress, uh, mounting a whole revolution uh, based around ATM fees, you know, based around something that, that is really pretty small for most people. Uh, 
and people died. Tens of thousands of people got arrested and, and, and did acts of civil disobedience. There were martyrs around this symbolic thing. Uh, in the in incremental terms, in institutional terms, it didn't make much sense. But for building a movement, it they was bad. That's right. Thank you, Paul. Let's go to the fourth one, leadership and resources. So how did these two traditions build power, essentially? So I'll talk in the structure context. So really in the structure context, you get power if you have more leaders, if you have more people that can have a following. And usually those are indigenous leaders that kind of form teams. Uh, and some of the ways that you build power is to do it a lot of listening, a lot of one-on-one -on -one campaigns. Uh, in the PICO network and the IF tradition, there's this whole listening campaign. So you talk to like you know, 200 one-on-ones, 300 one-on-one -on -one meetings. Some people do 1,000 one-on-one meetings. Teams just go and talk to people, sit down, do house meetings, find what's the key issue, look for leaders, train leaders. I mean, some people even spend a whole year in this organization's building leadership and power before doing a campaign. It's a whole understanding how you're going to do power, you know? But in the momentum tradition, it's differently. Yeah, Paul, do you want to talk about that? So when we were in the anti-globalization movement, uh, almost all of our leaders were recruited through big actions. And then because everybody wanted to participate in these dramatic actions and that were hyped up, and it was almost like concert promotion. How we absorb them is we signed people up at actions. We had mass meetings where people could, anybody could show up regardless of where their leadership was. And then we gave them just little tools, little things to do. And the mass meetings was the primary mechanism at which we were able to absorb people. Not, we could never even talk to everybody that showed up as organizers. In some ways, we had to figure out new ways of tapping the momentum. And the last distinction team that we will make is the difference between hierarchical and decentralized. And for example, in this structure, which we're claiming is hierarchical, and again, team, we're making two polarities. So some people might be more in the middle in one side or the other, but just, just for the sake of the explanation of the two polarities of the traditions. But really, the structure is really coordinated by a leadership team, either, a, either, either the big leader or either all the other, you know, kind of an executive team that really leads the campaigns lead support. And actually the way that this manifests itself is that this leadership body is the one that is constantly making campaign decisions. Uh, usually campaign decisions are not de that decentralized to local teams. Usually it's more at the top, which we can see in a lot of labor unions. The IF organizations have their executive teams. Even in United Region, we have our National Coordinating Committee, which is kind of our regional body of leaders that make decisions and campaigns consistently. But in Momentum, it's different. It's decentralized. Uh, Paul, you want to talk about that? Well, when we, in the momentum tradition, uh, the, the, there's a bottleneck in leadership. And so everybody in the whirlwind wants to participate. So a lot of times the structure creates ways to give everyone a common framework. A lot of times it emerges that a, a common brand, a meta narrative, uh, a vision of the movement, and also uh, somewhat of a grand strategy. Sometimes it's emergent, sometimes it's developed by leadership, but it allows everyone to be coordinated in a decentralized manner because they know some of the essential elements of what everybody is working on and what the, the, the basic strategy and theory of change is. Now, in good decentralized structures, that is done better than in, in others. But Momentum really thinks about how do we coordinate a shared strategy, not from the top leadership, but how do we disseminate it to everybody? And in structure, the other side would be of the coin would be, well, why do we want all these people if we cannot control them and manage them? If they will do, what if they do stuff that the organization doesn't want them to do? So that's kind of like the conflict that the people in structure go when you have masses of people that want to join your organization. So I think we make this five different distinctions, but now we want to take another quick break. If you're in your house, wherever you are in your office, take a little deep breath, sit up straight in your chair, move your body a little bit. I know we're in a webinar. It's kind of boring sometimes. But we want to take a little time for doing some reflection. And we have some questions. You don't have to answer all of them. But the first one would be, what do you see as the main differences in these two traditions? So we laid out five. What do you think about them? What is your reflection? What, what is your gut telling you about that? And then what are some of the skills or key skills that you see in each tradition? And the last one is, what are the strengths of each tradition? What is, what is 
what's powerful about each one. You don't have to answer all of them. Uh, any of them will be fine. We just want to get to see where your thinking is at, and then we'll go to the third and last part of the webinar. So, Belle, we'd love if you can show up in our screen as magic again. <laughs> you, Belinda, where are you? Hi. <laughs> oh Hi my again. God, she's still there. <laughs> Okay, great. So first, um, we had a question come in from Curtis during um, during your presentation. So if we could uh, take that question really quick while people are writing down their answers, I think that would be great. Um, Curtis, can you tell go. it to us? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, he wanted to know. Yeah. So yeah. how would you measure that shift? Go. Yeah, so in terms of momentum organizing, how could we measure the shift in act active public support? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this ties in with also the, how, how do you measure that success of an action, right? What, how do we know what we're doing is working, right? Is it just polling? Is it, uh, how has that been done? Um, so uh, my brother is actually one of the experts that have analyzed how public opinion around uh, Basically, globalization movement has changed because of the movement change in public opinion around Seattle and the other mobilization um, things. And I think what you can do is, first thing, polling. There's a lot of ways to poll not just the majority, but, but subgroups to see how active uh, people are and how, how much the, they've changed their opinions so that they, they want to participate. This was done in the immigrant rights movement after 2006. Uh, there was a lot of polling by the New Democratic Network with, that really showed that there was literally anywhere between 15 and 30 percent increases in get out the vote, and that they were able to trace it primarily through public opinion shift because of participation in the mass marches. Um, so there's a lot of a public opinion, but I think on a practical level as an organizer, uh, Online media is like the biggest net where we can throw the net to capture some of the momentum. And a lot of that is easily quantified by, by seeing things go viral, seeing um, momentum be absorbed into email lists, into social media, and all that. Those are like the first things. And then there's other ways which we can measure whether or not our momentum can be absorbed. But those are sort of my initial responses. Uh, Paul, are any of Mark's materials on that available anywhere? Sure, sure, I, I can make them available. Uh, we we also did an analysis, uh, Paulina Gonzalez and I, of uh, how the change in public opinion around immigrant rights after 2006 uh, was affected uh, with co collaborating with a lot of different people who were doing pollsters. So I, I'd probably make that available too. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Curtis. Okay, so now that um, folks have had some time to reflect, um, I'm curious, does anyone have, does anyone want to answer these questions? If, if you need a little bit more time and you are listening to our discussion, that's totally okay too. We can wait another minute. And also if you want to answer one of the questions and not all of them, that's also totally cool. And the silence okay, continues. great. Zane, hold on. Let me let me find you on the list. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think I, I was kind of responding to the strengths. What what is one of the strengths of the tradition? And I think I was my political consciousness was raised. I think with this given this framework more on the momentum side. So this might be my bias coming through, but um, I think. A lot of these key differences that were laid out, both kind of what victory means, so being more disruptive, kind of having more overturning moments, having demands be more transformational and kind of large, mm. uh, that pulling broad sections of the public. To me, one of those strengths, and it's showing up in some of my organizing work in Philly, is that um, there's some of the, some of those differences on the momentum side lend more towards vision and prefiguring mm. and offering. Uh, being able to demonstrate and enact alternatives in a way that the low and slow incremental change of structure um, where you're just kind of following the path one step at a time is harder to, to kind of dream and vision about where we want to end up at the end of the day. So 
a lot of people that we're organizing with in Philly that I think come from the more structured tradition talk about we're always trying to shift these balance of forces in our community in the political landscape and sometimes we're asking with well where are we trying to balance where are we trying to shift them to and where what's the vision of where we're going um, mm. and so for me right now that's that's tending towards one of the strengths of kind of momentum traditions that, that uh, or it's a question I'm interested in what other people think does it allow us to have more vision and more um, tap into our imagination of, of the world we want to see or where we want to go in, in, in the large transformational broad mm. suite. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Mm. Okay. Should we continue, so, Beth? Um, yeah, we, Guido volunteered if needed, um, but how are we on time? I think we should continue and then we can come back at the end with more so we can have more of an open discussion around the okay. whole webinar. I think I think that makes sense because it's almost okay, great. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> um okay, great. So we're gonna continue and then um we'll leave it open for discussion if folks wanna stay after eight thirty. Perfect. Okay. So team the last part of our series is that okay, so we are first we're telling you there's these two traditions, right? Or two dominant traditions. We're putting them on a spectrum. So that some people fall in different places. They were actually going through what are those two about, what are some of their key differences. But actually what Paul and I are arguing is that most change would happen in, most change or most revolution or most excitement could really happen in integrating these two. As many of you already seen the patterns that it's not either one or the other, it's kind of a combination of the two in different parts. Uh, so. One of the guys that we learned dramatically from is Ivan Marovic. He's a guy, he was one of the leaders, service student leaders in Otford. And I know, uh, Paul, maybe you want to talk about this quote that you got from Ivan around his revelation. Well, I just want to say that after the immigrant rights movement, after the anti-globalization movement, the momentum died down and we felt like we lost the movement. We were depressed and we were trying to look for answers. And we were really lucky that uh, we did a training, partly from the support of the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, um, and they helped us uh, bring in some trainers from Serbia. And Ivan Marovic, we met him, and we realized that there's a lot of other organizing cultures that are integrating structure and momentum all across the globe. There's tons of different models, and actually, there's also a lot of different uh, momentum cultures that emerge from student movements. And that in Serbia, they had an experience of really having a huge student strike that lasted for months, but the momentum died down and they didn't overthrow the dictator and they were really depressed and they came up with an integration that overthrew their dictator. And we were trying to think through uh, our organizing cultures and form our organization, but um, we were using the Clamshell Alliance, and we were using um, a little bit of our study from the Civil Rights Movement, and we were using the Solinsky tradition, and we realized that Akpor had a very complex organizational model of integrating structure and momentum. They called it mass protest and organization instead of momentum and structure. But um, we realized that uh, when we were trying to, to figure out a model, they sort of drew, drove up with like a, a Ferrari that would have already been constructed while we were just like working on a bicycle. It was so much more complex than anything we'd ever imagined. And um, that model uh, is, is now used in a lot of different places. Uh, sometimes it's not the same model, but it, it's evolved from Octor, and a lot of other countries have different models that are amazing. And what Ivan has done since the revolution in Serbia, him and some other trainers, have really done a lot of training and what Ivan says is that he, some of the most uh, biggest breakthroughs for him is he says, I've been in many countries in this time after the failure of mass protest. And it is in this time when they have this revelation. They need both protest and organization. This is when they have the breakthrough. One of the most important things in my training can help give them is that revelation, that they need the hybrid between mass protest and organization. And he says, when he's been to Ukraine, he's been to Egypt, he's been to Georgia, he's trained in all these countries, and he realized that the revolution a lot of times breaks out, uh, in, a lot of times in Arid Spring too, when they have a group of organizers that form a new inter 
integration in their own country and they form a new model within their country. But it takes, in some ways, an experience of momentum and feeling depressed and reflecting on it and forming a new integration that allows these revolutions to break out. And we've seen these, this happen in, in, in the Arab Spring. Uh, these revolutions have used a lot of different momentum-driven models and different types of integration that are different than the United States of America. We see it in, um, in, in a lot of other traditions. Great. Hey, folks, um, Paul and Carlos, I'd like to do a time check because I just want to be respectful of people's time. We said we were going to end at 831. Um, so how, how much how much time is left in on your slides? Approximately, if you could guess. Maybe 10 minutes. OK, great. So uh, for people out there, there's about 10 minutes left of presentation. Um, if you need to go, that is a OK. And I will follow up with you about on email on anything that you missed. And we all will also have a video available so you can catch up. But OK, cool. I just wanted to do a quick time check. So Gandhi was this um, amazing uh, integral thinker between structure and momentum. Uh, he formed this grassroots uh, base of the Indian National Congress, still to this day, uh, Indian politicians uh, revel in, in, in how amazing the past Indian National Congress was in the level of organization it had. Every village had a chapter that was super active. It could mobilize people through structure. But really, Gandhi's genius wasn't just that he was a good structure-based organizer, but he could mount successive cycles, sometimes every four years, sometimes every decade. He could create momentum and moments of the whirlwind, which a lot of people in the structure-based uh, traditions of the Indian National Congress thought was a miracle that Gandhi could do this. But he, he was able to figure out how do, you, how do you create a moment of the whirlwind and how do you create structure and how do you go in a cycle over and over and over again so that the struggle lasted for, for decades and decades uh, before they actually won. And this also did not happen just with Gandhi, but also Cesar Chavez follow a lot of them in the United Farm Workers. And you can actually see in the United Farm Workers more, Cesar, actually he came from the structured tradition, right? Trained by Fred Ross. Fred Ross was trained by Saul Alinsky. Really Cesar was trying to figure out how to build a union in the fields. Uh, but really the question I think with Cesar is how he used momentum to get more support from the outside. So for example, he would do stuff that people wouldn't understand, like, well, now we're going to do a pilgrimage from, you know, from Delano to Sacramento, and we're going to walk all the way. People will say, well, why the heck are you doing that? You don't have chapters in this area. So he will say, no, 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 that's going to get people excited. That's going to get momentum. Then they could organize them into teams. Or he did his 15-day fast, and people say, why are you doing that, this or what? But it's how he used the media and how he actually went, and went from forming an organization to really creating a movement. It's the farm workers' movement, and then how to feed that into the structure. So this integration has actually happened in many places throughout history. Like, for example, in Poland, which Paul will talk more about. Well, I think the, what's interesting about the, the, the farm worker movement is there was a tradition of wildcat strikes in the field that Cesar really capitalized on. That, so, but he didn't come from that tradition. He came from structuring. And in Poland, it, the solidarity movement originally started through a lot of wildcat strikes. But um, unlike uh, uh, the model in Serbia and some of the color revolutions, the Solidarity Movement was able to really institutionalize, form a political party, form a union that was incredibly powerful institutions and structure that was able to, even after the moment of the world when, when they got the major concession that they were going to transition into democracy, they were able to mount multiple general strikes uh, through their structure. They were able to, when, when they wanted to, create a moment of the world when. And because of that, uh, they had an amazing transition from sort of a, a communist dictatorship to a, a, a more uh, participatory democratic system. It's not perfect, but that movement is really a model of what a movement can do between structure and momentum. The last one, South Africa. So um, uh, I learned a lot of this from uh, a thinker in uh, Janet Sherry, who talked about how uh, the anti-apartheid movement created uh, a lot of structured-based community organizations and 
unions that were very po powerful and covered a huge mass of people in the South Africa. But they were winning incremental changes, and there was a shift in the movement in the last decade where they chose to go into a more momentum-based civil resistance strategy. And because of that, um, they had a lot of concrete organizations that could mobilize people in ways that momentum couldn't. They could mount very effective uh, boycotts, and they could mount series of secessions of momentum and moments of the world win, and then go back and, and formalize their structure and go back and forth. And uh, so I think that's an interesting model uh, that you can look at. Thank you, Paul. And team, we're coming to the end of our webinar, but I think, and Paul, you might add one add to this as well, but I think really what we're advocating for, what we think is a new frontier, what we really think is gonna cause revolution is the integration of both structure and momentum, which we're calling the hybrid model or integration. And uh, in the next couple of weeks, I think, uh, while we do our calls, we're going to get deeper into the theory. So how do we do the integration? What is the theory behind it? What's the understanding behind it? Then in the third one, we'll talk about, well, what are some of the models and the practices of that? So what are the best practices that we have seen? We'll analyze the odd-for model. We'll analyze what happened in other countries. We'll analyze what happened here in the U.S., like in the civil rights movement or in other movements. Uh, but, Paul, can you talk a little bit about this, the new organizing tradition that we're trying to bring into the U.S.? Well, Yvonne said the breakout of revolution when he does these trainings is often from people like you, people that are on this phone call. Uh, I have talked to a lot of labor leaders, a lot of really powerful people in advocacy organizations uh, in the labor movement and the immigrant rights movement, but really the breakthrough that I've experienced is people who have experienced momentum like uh, the people on this phone call, like the Dream Defenders, like people in the climate justice movement, like people in Occupy. I think we're in that special moment right now where we, we felt momentum and we want to create integration. And I really believe that the, the new movements are going to come out of this reflection, not just for me, but all of us creating a new organizing culture, a new organizing tradition in the United States. And hopefully it could be in many different movements and we can borrow from each other. And I really think a lot of that happened in the 60s where yeah. movements created traditions and then they borrowed from each other and the momentum sparked fires that then transferred over to different issues. And really I'm hoping that this webinar this is just a simple introduction, but we really want to get into uh, a deep understanding of how to create moments of the world win, how to absorb the momentum, and really form a new hybrid in the United States of America. And that means we need your help. We need you to be part of our, this, this new school and this new innovation. And a lot of people I talk to who are organizers say there isn't that much space to talk because we're in our silos between structure and momentum. Even my my eldest brother Francis like doesn't like talking to me about momentum. Uh, so everybody here is somebody I feel uh, is the one who's really doing the thinking about how to to create a hybrid in your own movement. And I really believe that that is the big breakthrough. Thank you so much, Paul. I, I mean, Tim, that's I think what we want at the end of the day, and that's what gets me so excited about this. And actually, some of the people from immigrant rights that are in this call are here because we want to do that in immigrant rights. So we'll just go through the last two sites. We have some homework. We'll send you, because of time, we'll just send you an email about it, but it's just three articles that will really support the thinking that we put out today, and so you can get prepared for our next calls. Uh, but let's open it up for questions. We have a next class coming up next week, and we'll talk more about the hybrid theory. So maybe, Bell, you want to help us in this. Great. Yeah, cool. So um, Guido, if you still want to talk, uh, you're next on stack. And if not, um, there was a question from Kurt. Oh, Kurt has to go. OK, bye, Kurt. OK, so Guido, you're up. Uh, oh, well, okay. I guess I can just still make a, a small point about the distinction between uh, momentum and structure. Um, I think a lot of people get confused when they are running campaigns that have a specific target, but within a larger movement uh, that is using a theory of change of momentum. Um, because mm -hmm. within the campaign context, 
um, you're you're thinking about how do you move your target, and you are thinking in some ways like a structural organizer. You're just trying to leverage enough power, but it's easy to forget that the campaign and the organization doesn't actually matter. Um, it only matters to the extent that it's polarizing people and delegitimizing the larger status quo yeah. uh, that you're fighting. And structural organizers are very different because they're saying, no, we're trying to build an organization for the long term. That, that, you know, uh, Saul Linsky was all about strong organizations. Every campaign is building your organizational strength. Momentum, you don't care as much. You just you just want to polarize so that you get the shift. The org if the organization falls apart after you win, you don't care as much. We might like it to stay together, but it, so there's there's a different emphasis on how important maintaining the organization is within the short and the long term. Mm. Cool. Thanks, Guido. Thank you. Very good. Does anyone else have um, questions or comments? Feelings and impressions? I would just like to have some feedback. Was that was that helpful? I, I feel like I gave my yeah. heart. So uh, Leland has Leland was has feelings. Helpful? Leland. Oh, <clears throat> I thought this was awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm incredibly excited to have just been on this on this call and to be in the next in the next few ones as well. And I just wanted to thank you guys so much. Cool. Thank you. And then uh, Curtis submitted a comment. He said, this is great, and he's excited for the next couple of weeks. Do you want to also speak, Curtis? He's good. OK, cool. Does anyone else have comments or questions? Paul and Carlos are very smart, so if you want uh, resources or readings in a particular area, they can suggest things to you. Okay. Okay. Bell, can I do the closing? Uh, Zane says very helpful frameworks. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, th yeah, we can shift into closing. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you for listening to Paula, myself, and Belinda doing this webinar. We're excited. We're about. This is just the beginning. We're about to jump into. We're about to get up on the roller coaster by next week. And hopefully we're going to go down in a lot of speed. So thank you so much. You know where to reach us. We'll see you next Tuesday, same time. We'll keep it more brief and have more questions. Paul, you want to say something please, at the end? Please read everything. Read, 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 everything. read. Please read. I know that I wrote all the articles. So maybe I'm a little biased. But um, it's good I, stuff. It's I, good stuff. I, need, I, need, uh, I need feedback, too, on these articles, uh, especially the the piece about uh, creating moments of the world that we'd love to get your input on them, but it, it solidifies and talks about uh, civil resistance, which I'm really grateful for that field for giving a, a lot of the framework for uh, this webinar, um, but also a lot of 